so welcome to this talk. Uh, it's, I know it's kind of an interesting one doing uh, um, all virtual. I wish I could see all of you guys so I could judge whether you're falling asleep or engaged or not, but uh, we'll just, we'll give it a go. So um, uh, Luma Pictures, were a visual effects company. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's basically, we make pretty pictures for uh, mostly feature films. Um, so computer generated images like this one from Spider-Man uh, Homecoming. Now, on a scale of one to 10,000, which is about how big the largest visual effects companies get, we're a little over 200. So we're modestly sized, but we like to think that we punch uh, well above our weight. Uh, we work on the largest tentpole uh, movies alongside the juggernauts of the industry. Um, and in order to achieve that, we have a really heavy focus on, on automation and innovation and adopting new technologies. And uh, Beam is one of those. Uh, I'm going to walk you through how we use Beam to automate the creation of visual effects. Uh, so just to give you a sense of some of the work that we've done, I, I would have loved to show um, our demo reel, but uh, it, you know, 20 minutes is not a whole lot of time. So this is uh, Spider-Man uh, Far From Home, one of the more recent ones. And uh, this is Ant-Man and the Wasp. And this is a completely computer-generated image. All right. In order to understand how Beam can fit into this, uh, it's important to realize that the creation of visual effects and a visual effects company is a lot like a digital factory. So a kind of assembly line. So um, the uh, each it's composed of a bunch of different departments. Uh, each department has um, artists and technicians who are specialists in that area, and they create a, a digital artifacts that they pass uh, down the stream to the next department, and so on and so forth until the finished product is assembled, and that's uh, ultimately delivered to the client. And uh, in our case, the finished product is a shot in a movie, um, so some contiguous series of, uh, of frames. Um, so you can think about it like this. Um, a client will shoot some things on set, right? Imagine green, green screens and whatnot. Um, and they'll deliver that footage to us. And it's our job to integrate the computer generated images, replace those green screens with CGI, and then deliver those movies back to the client. Now there's a, um, a many to many relationship between assets and shots. Um, this is a bit of an oversimplification. There's you know hundreds of assets and hundreds of shots in a typical movie like Spider-Man Far From Home. Um, to walk you through kind of, you know, where Beam fits into this and what it what it, it can be capable of doing, let's imagine a scenario where uh, we have a Spider-Man asset. It's in these four shots. We've delivered rough drafts of these things uh, to the client. And the client says, you know, looks good, but it would be great if we can make Spider-Man, you know, less bulky, kind of trim him down, make him look leaner. Okay. So in order to do that, we have to go back to the beginning of this workflow, um, which is right uh, the modeler. It's the person who sculpts that mesh. And that modeler makes those adjustments and makes this new revision of that model. And that has to be passed downstream through each of these departments, integrated in, uh, into each one and until and we reproduce that final deliverable to give to the client. And keep in mind, you know, Spider-Man might be in 100 shots. So that's a lot of things that need to be recreated. Now, why is this hard? There are some visual effects specific reasons why this is difficult, but let's get into kind of the technical reasons that, you know, anybody who's into, um, you know, data processing can relate to. So we, um, we have a bunch of different tasks that we use to automate this. The real challenge though, is this end to end automation. We want to, and it's kind of the like holy grail of the visual effects pipeline to be able to do what we're talking about. to so do this full set of automation. And, uh, um, so, but any visual effects pipeline has some amount of automation in it already, which we define as tasks. And these tasks have heter heterogeneous complexity. So some of them, um, many of them um, can be quite short, you know, several seconds or even, you know, uh, sub, sub second. But then many of them are like for a single task can take uh, hours. If you imagine like something like render or simulation um, to make, 24 to make one second of footage that you see in a film, it could take days of computation time. Now, so we have this real split between these you know, different types of work that we need to do. Uh, additionally, the tasks that we, that we deploy at sort of each phase of, the, of this automation, uh, they're dynamic. There's not just one recipe for the whole thing. In many scenarios, what happens is we have to open up some data, you know, take a peek inside, 
And then based on what we see there, we have some code that will generate sort of the next set of tasks. And um, additionally, where this uh, automation is occurring, it happens inside embedded Python interpreters. So one of the things that's super awesome about visual effects is that each one of those departments has some, uh, some different application that they use for their specialized um, purpose. And they almost all have Python interpreters built in. So this is incredible for automation. But by definition, it means that when we're trying to automate this, uh, the automation has to occur in different processes because they are different applications. And that introduces the complexity of, sort of inter-process communication and management. And to add to that, uh, the processes that we're running uh, are unstable. They can often crash. So uh, typically, the Python code that we run will be setting up some kind of render or simulation. And, uh, and those renders can be really expensive uh, and uh, multi-process, uh, you know, and potentially use 128 gigs of RAM going to swap and ultimately crash. And that's just kind of the way that things are. All right, so we said, okay, how are we ultimately going to, uh, to automate all of this? Uh, and basically, one of the first observations that we came up with was that the, this, um, DAG, this task DAG-based approach that we have right now, it's not really working for us. Um, we're, we're micromanaging these tasks um, and, and wiring them into DAGs, and, um, and it's just not, it's not flexible enough. We, we're writing all this code in order to generate these tasks and, uh, and we need something sort of higher level, some, some kind of rules for how we generate these. So we started observing well, what kind of patterns do we have here? And um, what we observed is that uh, the task generation pattern roughly fits MapReduce. Um, but the big difference is we're not computing a numeric result, we're, we're orchestrating events. Sorry. And that requires um, a different type of technology um, than MapReduce. And we observed that flow-based programming is a really good fit for this. Uh, and ultimately, so we, we evaluated like what other companies were doing in terms of uh, technology in this kind of space. And, um, and we ultimately came across Beam. We laid out all of our requirements and um, we can't, I can't really go into too much detail on these right now, but um, we basically uh, you know, evaluated a bunch of different options and Beam came out just head and shoulders above the rest. Um, but it's not perfect. So we have this big challenge, and this is how do we use Beam's great capability in event processing in order to achieve uh, and orchestrate these rendering and simulation tasks. So the key thing to understand about the rendering and simulation tasks is that we've got a lot of work to do, far more than we can do in a really like low latency scenario like, like Beam is great at. Uh, we have so much. We have we have more work to do than we have resources, and that means that by that we have a backlog. And anytime we have a backlog, scheduling becomes important. So uh, we use a, a rendering uh, scheduler called Deadline, and it's really good at solving uh, the types of uh, at at um, executing the types of tasks that we have. These really long running renders and simulations, but it's not very good at the these little small uh, tasks, and and that's because uh, you know, we, like we talked about, the task can be really unstable. So typically every task is run in its own process and that has uh, overhead. So uh, the, big, the big problem here is how do we, uh, you, you know, we, can, we know we can take a lot of those simple tasks and shift them out of deadline, move them into, uh, into Beam. And, uh, and then we can add more tasks in, in Beam that are around flow control. And, and so the real goal is how do we use event processing tasks in order to generate these rendering and simulation, these long running tasks that need to be scheduled and, uh, and, and keep those tasks running in a uh, deadline where uh, we have to answer a number of visual effects specific user stories. So we set about tackling this and the first uh, approach that we took was really kind of the, the simplest one. We wrote a custom transform that would ultimately deliver that work to deadline to do, to, uh, to do that scheduled work there. And the way that it works is basically you have, you know, you define, you know, this high level pipeline that represents all the work that you want to automate. And uh, within that pipeline, there's a lot of flow control transforms, but then there are these special transforms that wrap some child pipeline. And that child pipeline represents the work that we want to do in our batch scheduler. Now, when that transform runs, it 
does the work of serializing that child pipeline, sending it off to our batch scheduler deadline as a task, and then uh, and then it will run that uh, that task and deadline that that beam pipeline, and then take the results from that, integrate it back into the parent pipeline, and and let that pipeline continue running, ultimately flowing downstream to uh, to additional uh, tasks that we want to schedule in the deadline. So we've been using this for over a year now, and it works quite well, but there are some problems. You know, one of the big ones is that not all Beam features are supported. Uh, so you can imagine these child pipelines are kind of like crudely bolted into this parent pipeline. You know, we're using PubSub to manually send and synchronize uh, in data between them. Uh, and so things like side inputs between the parent and child, uh, they don't work because those child pipelines are kind of like opaque to the parent pipeline. Uh, another sort of idiosyncrasy is that the pipelines don't shut down properly. Um, and this is a little bit more to, that we can go into, but it has to do with uh, the PubSub and streaming pipelines and relationship to those child pipelines. And a big one is that it was difficult for the authors of these um, pipelines, these beam pipelines, to reason about what the behavior would be. Because uh, at the parent pipeline, you have your normal beam semantics, but then how those transforms interact with that child and how, how data sort of streams from that parent into the child and from the child back into the parent is kind of our own like hacky solution to this. So we said, all right, we can do better than this. Let's lay out all the requirements, all the user stories that we want to solve for this. And, um, and you know, ultimately around how to get these tasks scheduled in deadline. And the big motivator here is um, trying to make this more seamless approach so that um, this kind of loose coupling that we have uh, with the transform-based approach becomes deeply integrated uh, into Beam. <clears throat> so I'm going to uh, provide these uh, requirements kind of as a definition of this new concept, a scheduled task. So a scheduled task can be composed of multiple fused transforms. So this is um, in comparison or in, in distinction with a, uh, a single you know, user-defined function. Um, a scheduled task resources can be specified per element in the stream. So the, the big, the, you know, the idea here is as your, uh, your Beam pipeline is iterating over elements, each element might need a different amount of resources in order to process it. The parallelism of a scheduled task is independent of the runner. So we're shipping this work off to some, you know, to something that's able to schedule work. And that uh, system, in our case, deadline uh, has its own ideas of what uh, parallelism can be. Uh, and uh, and so that, by definition, is going to be different from what uh, Beam and its and the runner that it's on uh, the type of parallelism that it's capable of. A failed task can be re retried rather than aborting the pipeline. This is crucial. We talked about how our task can be really flaky. So when a task gets to deadline, our users, um, artists, and technicians can look at individual tasks that have failed, potentially tweak them, and retry them until they succeed again. If we have this pipeline that's reacting to events throughout our studio, like you know, user published new version of this model, a new version of animation, uh, that we want that thing to sort of be always running. It's kind of a generic recipe for for how we automate this end to end result, and we don't want um, little failures like this to take the whole pipeline down. And last but certainly not least, a uh, pipeline with scheduled tasks should support all Beam features and semantics. This goes back to that original problem that we identified. We just want people to be able to author pipelines and not have to worry about, you know, like the relationship between uh, parents and child pipelines. So we went through m more than a dozen, maybe close to two dozen different proof of concepts on how to answer or how to address all these uh, user stories. And what we came up with was this concept of external task workers. In order to achieve this, we had to modify the Beam Python SDK, which is not really our first choice, but it ended up being by far the most powerful. And we added this concept of a pluggable batch scheduler. So as an example, you could hook up Kubernetes as a batch scheduler. Uh, Kubernetes has a, a type of schema, which is a batch job. Um, an element, as it flows through your pipeline, can be tagged with properties to deliver to that, uh, to indicate that it should be delivered to that um, batch scheduler. So we have this class, it's called a taskable value. Uh, you can write a transform, which will essentially detect uh, values in your stream that should be ex executed externally and wrap that uh, uh, in this taskable value class and give it the properties. Like those properties would be things like amount of CPU and amount of RAM that would be required to execute that particular task. 
And then the SDK worker will, as it iterates over this stream of data, will detect those tasks that should be externalized and it will send them off. Uh, and all this is transparent to the rest of your, uh, to rest of Beam and your runner. The, the basic idea is that we are spinning up little clones of that SDK worker that are transient. They last only for the lifespan of that task. But when we spin it up, we hook up the whole control plane, data plane and everything so that it looks just like another SDK worker in this pool of workers to execute. But then it'll get shut down and then a new one will get started up and we can run many of them at, at once, however many your, uh, your task worker, your task scheduler can execute. Uh, so um, this has been, you know, it's still pretty early for us. We've been working on this for a while, but we see it has a lot of uh, potential. We're going to be rolling it out soon and start battle testing this. And um, if anybody is interested in, um, you know, in this, feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out um, on the, the Beam user list and uh, let's gauge interest and see if other people are kind of facing the same types of problems that, that we are. And ultimately, if there's interest, then, you know, we're certainly happy to uh, make this contribution back to, to Beam. So I'm really excited to see what comes of this. Uh, so thanks everybody for, that's the uh, that's my presentation. Big, big thanks to the Beam team at Google and Apache, and also to Viola and Sam, uh, the two engineers who do the vast majority of the heavy lifting on this project. Yeah. Um, that is that. Looking forward to, uh, to getting some questions. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation and for um, sticking to the tight time constraints here. So let's um, go, let's ask some questions. So um, there's still more coming in, but um, the first one I wanted to ask is, but you kind of alluded to it, or I mean, you said it in the end already, um, since you are um, sort of using this to orchestrate the, the whole dependencies for um, the special effects creation, um, have you looked into other, um, did you evaluate also Airflow, for example, as a, as a another piece of technology? Was that in the in the comparison list you showed? Absolutely, yeah, that, that definitely was in the list. And so if you, um, you know, if you go through that list of requirements we have there, um, you know, and evaluate it, you'll sort of see that Airflow doesn't come up nearly as, as strongly as, uh, as Beam does in our list of requirements. Uh, and Airflow is used for orchestration, that's pretty much its primary purpose, but, one of the things that we realized about Beam is that even though it's designed for this like super high throughput, um, you know, event, you know, based processing, that it's really good at orchestration. Uh, and and we kind of think of it as a, like a microservice um, orchestration engine, right? So you define the work that you want to do. I have these transforms that happen in this, you know, in this order. Uh, and then you bind some environments to it. These transforms should run in this Docker container. These should run in this Docker container. And then you let Beam handle the rest, right? It will basically fuse transforms that can run together in one service. It will spin up as many services as you know as you have for you know need for parallelism. It defines how you make all those things, allow those things to communicate with each other as its own protocol for solving that. So if you could do all that on your own, you could write your own services, you could come up with your own pro protocol, but you'd just be doing all the same work that Beam already does for you. So um, it's just excellent at basically like serving up you know, ad hoc services where you don't have to worry about like all the bootstrapping and you just define this is the work that I want and here's how it relates to the next set of work that I want to do. That makes perfect sense. Another question is what kind of state size are you dealing with? Oh, state is not, it's not really massive. I mean, so what we're doing is we're reacting to events happening inside our studio. Those are the events. We're not reacting to like, you know, and our studio is only 220 people, right? We don't have this, you know, many thousands, tens of thousands of, of, of users and, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of events. Um, they're sort of trickling in as, you know, in like user, t like within this, within our walls effectively, right? So, you know, the amount of data that we're processing is is relatively small. However, I will say that, uh, in terms of state, we do a lot of complex flow control. And one of our big requirements was having transforms that could hold on to state because we'll do things like, you know, essentially we're, we're placing, you know, you see those dependency nodes, right, in our tasks, right? This task has to run after this task. We're replacing those, those like strict uh, dependencies, that DAG, with flow control. So we're mm -hmm. sort of like, um, paying attention to relationships between things and holding that in state. And then once a, a certain sort of rule uh, is achieved, then we release, you know, 
um, more tasks to be generated on the farm. So it does require uh, state um, management, but it lets us do far more sophisticated flow control than simple DAG. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And another question, I think we have time for another question. Hi, Chad. Would you say you're using Beam as a DAG-based task distribution system, for example, compute workload distro for HPC? Hmm, I'm not familiar with, with HPC, actually. So let me think. So as a DAG-based task distribution system. So it depends on where we're talking with the DAG. So the Beam graph itself is a pipeline. Because of side, side inputs, it is roughly DAG-like. Um, and then the, the work inside that can you know, we can basically generate tasks um, in, in any kind of uh, task execution engine. Um, maybe AP, HPC is one of those. Kubernetes is example. Um, Google has their own actually open source project called OpenQ. Um, and um, potentially you could represent DAGs there as well. Typically the work that we'd be sending there would, um, you know, be just a segment of a pipeline, right? Essentially like we're, we're taking some stage within a pipeline, so you have many transforms. Some of those transforms get fused into a, a stage, right? And then we're sending that work off as a task. So what we're doing, and I should have explained this a little bit better, is we're dividing across the lifespan of the stream. We're taking a bundle and all the elements that are inside of that, and uh, we're, we're slicing that up, and we're saying each one of those things, these, these things is a task, mm -hmm. and we're sending that, that, that slice, that cross-section of a stage and, that, and an element, and saying, execute that work. Now, there's much greater overhead to doing that, right? This is why people wouldn't want to do this by default in Beam because you've got to ship that thing off. You've got to start that new, that new SDK worker up in order to execute that all just to do that one task. But if that task is really long and you need scheduling, then it's worth it. Makes sense. Um, and another question here, do you think you would consider contributing your changes to the worker, to the worker execution back to Beam? Do you think yeah, you could- absolutely. We're, you know, I, I think that the outstanding question right now is, you know, I think there's a couple. One is, is this something that people in the Beam community are interested in? Um, I, I'm certain that we'd get a decent amount of uh, interest from the visual effects and animation uh, industries if this feature were there. But the other question, a big one is, you know, getting us in front of uh, the Beam engineers and asking, hey, is there a better way to do this? Uh, you know, I, I think for sure we need to, to vet that um that that we you know integrated at the right place the good news is we've got a list of like 24 uh things that we ex that we attempted that that didn't meet all our requirements so we can and with a document so we can go through i'm sure people will be like hey what about this what about this and we'll just be like well nope 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 um so we'd love to have that conversation mm, i'm really curious to having this discussion on the main list cool <laughs> um then i think we are out of time now um thank you so much Jed, for your talk and my pleasure Thanks, Max. Have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody.